Hi, if you want to run your electronics projects for months or years on a battery, then sometimes you need to give it a little boost. One way is to use the energy emitted from that great fireball in the sky. But how does it work? What options do you have? And how can you use them? So first of all, how does a solar cell work? Let's go and ask a mate of mine who can explain it much better than me. So, I've got my currency, which is beer in Australia. So this mate of mine uh, used to be a science teacher at a high school. Uh, he knows a lot of stuff about everything. Yeah, if I can remember where he lives. Oh, here it is. Yep, this is him. What on earth were you thinking? What a silly thing to say. Oh, yeah. G'day, Pete. G'day, hey, Mick. What are you up to? Mark and mate. What every teacher does on the weekend. Fantastic. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Yeah, it'll cost you. Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Australian currency. It's only a four pack, Mick. Well, it's boutique beer, so I thought four might make up for it. Yeah, okay, alrighty. Yeah. Oh, banana bread beer. Oh, sounds good. It would take two hours. Uh, I've got three minutes. Cool. Well, I'll give it a go. Uh, okay, this is how it works. Look, I've got some papers here. Look, you know the element silicon, don't you? Yep. Second most common element in the Earth's crust. Mm -hmm. Well, silicon's got four electrons, okay, and it forms four bonds with other silicon atoms around it. it forms a little network like that, which is neither here nor there. But if you every now and then, one in a million or so, take out one of those silicon atoms and replace with, say, something like phosphorus, phosphorus has five electrons in the outer shell. It uses four to do that bonding, and it's got one spare electron. So speaking of dopes. Yeah, yeah, well, it's called, <laughs> a, it's called a dope, and that's right. So, you know, and that makes up half your cell, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Now, if you get another bit of silicon, you get another block, and with silicon, exactly the same, Nick, and it does its four bonds, and, but this time, instead of, when you take out a silicon, instead of replacing it with phosphorus, you replace it with something like, say, boron. Now, boron only has three electrons in the outer shell, mm -hmm. so it's missing an electron. Right. Now, if you were to put those two together, you create what's called an NP junction. This and side, be this the, side the because it's got an is the N. N, because it's got it's negative, it's got mm -hmm. extra electrons, and, and this side's P for positive. Yeah. yeah. Now, you can see what's going to happen. Yeah. The extra electrons, holes where there are no electrons, mm -hmm. there's going to be a drift of electrons across the junction which there is, mm -hmm. but there's a problem. As soon as the electrons come up here and start filling up the holes, you start building up a negative charge on this side. Well, the electrons with their negative charge, trying to get across to there, are repelled now by the negative, and it all mm -hmm. stops. Builds up to about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 a volt, nothing else. Ah, you here comes a, the trick. You need a way of escape. Exactly, so what you do is you then connect this around through a wire, mm -hmm. put in, say, a light bulb. Why not? Around to this side. Still doesn't work, me. Ah, here comes the trick. You go and put it out in the sun. sun. The energy from the sun excites all the electrons, mm -hmm. frees them up to move. Now, because you provided that external circuit, the electrons move from the end, round through whatever you want there, around to the positive, your voltaic cell. And that's called the photovoltaic effect? That is it? correct. You do know something, you see? Excellent. Not just a I pretty did, face. I did pay attention in science. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, thanks very much, Pete. Okay, mate. Will you get stuck into those beers? Sounds I'll good. I'll let you have one of the four. Sounds good. Okay. Can't actually have one of those, but I bought my own here, which is uh, oh, something for celiac. I wouldn't have minded a six pack of that. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I can bring one back again. Great, mate. Okay. Jeez. Mick, they're not twist off. Oh. That's no good. <laughs> well, what are we going to do now? So now that we understand the basics of how a solar cell works, we need to start looking at what solar cell panel and charger we need to buy. The first thing is to estimate just how much power your device consumes. If you have something that consumes an average of 25 milliamps, then you can sort of expect a 1000 milliamp hour battery to provide 40 hours of operation. It doesn't always work out like that in practice because specification accuracy varies greatly. So always do the engineering trick and double it. 
In this case, you would have a 50 milliamp hour current draw. The next thing is to figure out how long you want to run before you run out of juice. During winter in Australia, we have around 10 hours of daylight or 14 hours of battery life. But if you're living close to the Icelandic volcano, Ijafluff, Ija Flag, Flagy, Flagy, Allergic, Allergic, how do you say it? Allergic hole, Flag, Ija Flagger, Flagger coal. Okay, that volcanic mountain in Iceland, then you'll be seeing only four hours of sunshine in winter, which means 20 hours of battery life you'll need. Also, take into account that you'll have cloudy days or rainy days for sometimes weeks at a time. If you want your device to be running continuously, then that 20 hours of battery life might become a week. So our 50 milliamp device will require an 8.4 amp hour battery to last a full week without a charge. In reality, 50 milliamps is a lot and you can be creative with your code to reduce that number significantly. Now you have your current drawer and battery life, you'll need to select your solar panel and charging board. Since you want to be able to both run your device and charge the LiPo at the same time, you will need to take into account both these current drawers. The solar cell needs to be able to deliver both. The bigger the solar cell, the greater the current supplied and the faster the charge rate. The bigger cells will also be able to capture more sunlight and provide more daytime charge hours compared to the smaller cells. However, the bigger the cell, the more costly it is. So like all engineering problems, it's a balancing act. For example, this solar cell will provide 330 milliamps in full sunlight, while this one can push out 1.5 amps. From our example, the first one may not be able to push out enough current to charge that 8.4 amp hour battery as it will only be able to charge the battery using 280 milliamps. And you may not be able to ever fully charge the battery. Next up, you need to look at the solar charging board. There's roughly two different styles. One that employs MPPT, or Maximum Power Point Tracker, which will balance power output based on lighting conditions by measuring the current and voltage delivered by the cell. It usually employs a DC buck converter to stabilise the output voltage. While there's also passive circuits like this Adafruit board, their argument is that for a low wattage solar charger, an MPPT circuit is more expensive than a cheaper board with a larger solar cell. Whatever you choose, you need to also look at the output of the solar charger. The Adafruit version can push out up to 1 amp and the SparkFun board up to 2 amps. Pretty much all the boards have adjustable current output and you'll need to adjust it according to your battery size. You don't want to charge the battery using more current than it can normally output. Since we selected the 1.5 amp solar cell, then either option would do. But once again, make sure the output current of the charger doesn't exceed the output current of the LiPo. In terms of boards you can get, there's a SparkFun Sunny Bunny, which is an MPPT charger based on the LT3652 IC. Of course, the Adafruit PWM based charger. Seed Studio have the LiPo Rider Pro, which is a PWM based charger. DF Robot have a board based on the fairly popular CN3083 linear charger IC. And also, Tindy has a big supply of them as well. They all do the job, but if you want to maximise your solar cell charging capabilities and money is no objective, then start looking at MPPT based boards. If you want a simpler, cheaper type, then look at PWM chargers. Another thing to take into account is battery temperature. LiPo batteries tend to not charge well at lower temperatures. This Tindy store has a solar charger that is a bit expensive, but it monitors battery temperature and will heat the battery prior to charging if it's too low. Like anything, there's always a trade-off between cost and efficiency. So hopefully that has given you a brief introduction into solar cells. In a later video, I'll be taking a couple of these boards for a test run to see how they go. Thanks for watching. See you next week. I, I, uh, I, I, uh, 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 u